It will scarcely be believed that the island, which is a British dependency, is absolutely unlighted. Some seven years since I was speaking on the subject to Captain Conlon, then of the Orient Company's ship Orizaba, who said there will never be a light on the Socotra until a P&O ship is wrecked there. Opinion piece written to the London Times, 1897. Captain Conlon proved to be incorrect. The wreck of a P&O ship did not result in a lighthouse being built, though it did make more people call for one. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story? A meager jubilee on the Aiden. Here we are. Enjoy! The Aiden, a steel-hulled, screw-propelled steamship, was built in 1892 and owned by the Peninsula Oriental Steam Navigation Company, better known as P&O. The 2,517-ton ship was placed on a route that took her from Japan to China, and from there on to Sri Lanka, before heading to England. She sailed under the command of Captain Hill, who was well-known and considered an experienced captain. On April 8, 1897, the Aden departed from Yokohama with 83 crew members and had a smooth voyage until they reached Colombo, Sri Lanka. As she departed from Colombo on the 2nd of June, she had 34 passengers. On the 3rd of June came the first signs of bad weather, but by the 4th, it was a full monsoon that they were traveling through. The ship managed to push through until the 8th in spite of the waves that were washing away the deck coal that had been loaded in Colombo. The weather did lead Captain Hill to make a change in their course. He directed the ship to head closer to Cape Guadrafui to counteract the northeast current being formed by the southwest monsoon. Captain Hill believed that the course that he had charted would take them to the north of Socotra. It was noted, though, that Captain Hill had not been able to take observations for a couple of days before the 8th due to the poor weather, so this course was created with dead reckoning. They had to slow down for a little while, so they could get the deck coal into the bunkers where it could no longer be washed away, and then they continued on the course that Captain Hill had charted. With Captain Hill telling a couple of the passengers that he expected to enjoy the shelter offered by Socotra around 11 p.m. or midnight at the rate that they were traveling. The passengers on the starboard side of the ship had suffered the most. Some of them had water enter their cabins due to the rough weather, and so, as the ship turned in to sleep on the night of the 8th, Many of the passengers retired to the saloon, where they brought their mattresses rather than their cabins. Everyone was hopeful, though, that once they entered the Gulf of Aden, there would be smoother sailing. It was therefore a shock to everyone on board, when around three in the morning, on the ninth, there was a violent shudder felt through the ship and a grinding sound. There would never be a clear explanation given for what had caused the Aden to get so close to the rocks of Socotra, which were known to be dangerous. But it was clear that the ship's course had proven to be further to the south than they had thought. This would later partially be blamed on the need to transfer the duck cargo of coal to a place where it could not be washed away. The only way to transfer the coal was in baskets by hand and in the stormy weather, the captain had ordered the ship's course be altered slightly to reduce the violent rocking that was making the difficult task even more dangerous. It was later thought that this course alteration was at least partially to blame for the miscalculated location of the Aden. When the ship struck, it didn't take long for steam to begin to fill the saloon where many of the passengers had been sleeping 
and the electric lights went out suddenly, leaving shocked confusion among those who had been asleep only moments before. When there was a call for all passengers on deck, everyone rushed to the companionway, causing a bottleneck where some of the passengers were injured. Once on deck, very few of them had grabbed warm clothing, meaning that the passengers were now in the storm spray as they had gone to bed, and soon suffering from cold. Once calm had been restored, the steward ventured below deck and returned with warm clothing and blankets for the passengers, giving them welcome relief. As dawn broke, it allowed them to assess the situation. The Aiden had been equipped with six boats in total, three lifeboats and three other boats, which could hold in total 276 people, and the crew of the Aiden and the passengers combined only numbered 117. There should be more than enough boats for everyone, but that was without considering the beating that the ship had taken the waves the entire night. The waves had smashed all of the boats on the port side of the ship, leaving them with only the starboard boats to make use to make their escape. Captain Hill gave the order as soon as dawn broke to begin to get these ready. They were about two miles from the eastern point of Socotra. The first boat to be launched was one of the lifeboats, with three members of the crew on board. A heavy sea struck the boat, though, and it broke from the ropes. Chief Officer Cardin, seeing the three crew members and the boat start to drift away, grabbed a rope and jumped overboard with the hopes of bringing them back. But none of the four men were ever seen again. A second officer was sent in another boat, this time a cutter to try to rescue the first officer and hopefully bring back the lifeboat. The cutter was also swept away with its crew and was also never seen again. This left those on board the Aiden with only one boat left to launch, and this also did not go smoothly. This boat was under the charge of the third officer, and as they lowered her, the waves capsized her. The fourth officer slid down and helped right the ship and then swam out to rescue the stewardess, who could not swim, and bring her back to the boat. A third officer also took it upon himself to save two people on the boat, who also did not know how to swim. Passengers were then lowered into the boat, but they were not able to fill the boat to capacity, before the waves breaking over the ship made it so they had to shove the boat away from the ship. This boat also disappeared from sight of those on board the Aden and was also never seen again. Many of the passengers who had been lowered into the third and final boat had been women and some children, as well as the third and fourth officers. On board of this boat were also the European able-bodied seamen and the first and second engineers. The majority of the crew were from India, but the captain gave the European sailors the priority in taking their places in the boats. Three of the married women had refused to go into the boat and had instead chosen to remain on the wreck with their children so that they could remain with their husbands, who were not given a place in the boat. In total, 17 of the passengers were still on board, as were a majority of the crew. As the fate of the third boat was never determined, they could congratulate themselves on their good decision. It did not seem like it at the time, however. One of the passengers, Mr. Gillette, later told the story of what followed in detail, not only to the newspapers, but also to the following inquest. As the day went on, the waves became even stronger and they were soon sweeping the deck and battering the already exhausted people who were still on board, and the deck offered no shelter. The first person to be swept overboard was an infant, belonging to the Pierce family, who was swept from his mother's arms. Another infant was also soon swept away, as a wave hit a couple with a last name Strain. The husband soon followed their child overboard, carried by the wave while Mrs. Strain got her leg jammed under a piece of iron, and it took several people 
including Captain Hill, to lift the iron off of her and bring her back to safety. In the meantime, one of the nurses on board, who had been brought along to care for the Pierce children, was also carried overboard by the waves. Mrs. Strain was not strong enough to fight the pull of the sea, though, and she was soon carried away again. This time, there was no iron to prevent her from going overboard. Mr. Gillette tried to protect Mrs. Strain's remaining two-year-old daughter by shielding her with his body, but this resulted in both of them getting slammed by a wave into a far iron rail. Both were badly injured, but Mrs. Gillette, who was also one of the women who had refused to get on the boat, on realizing her husband was no longer by her side, rushed to help him and the two-year-old while telling their own daughter to hang on tight for a moment. Her rescue mission was a success, but the daughter of the Strain family was badly injured, and Mr. Gillette was now also too weakened to shield her as well. She was soon washed away as well. Mrs. Gillette, meanwhile, had also been thrown into the same iron by a wave, and now had a deep gash in her leg. The next wave hit hard, and carried both Captain Hill and Mr. Gillette away from the main group, though not overboard. Once he had recovered a little, Mr. Gillette sat up to realize that Captain Hill was nearby, still lying down, and with a clearly broken left leg. They dragged him back to the rest of the group and did their best to shelter him, but their efforts were not enough to prevent the next wave from carrying him off as well. Two older women who were traveling with one another and did not have any families on board were the next. One of them had been badly injured and the other refused to leave her side, and so they were both carried away together. Around 4 p.m., the sea began to grow a little calmer. The waves up to this point had carried away all of the woodwork structure at the front of the ship. The bridge, the chart room, and the captain's cabin were all gone. And the stairway to the saloon was now entirely unprotected and open to the sea. The remaining passengers, the Gillettes and their children, the Pierces with their remaining little boy, and a Mr. Valpy, decided to risk a run towards the saloon, with the waves no longer pounding over them so hard, in the hopes that the saloon still offered some shelter. While wandering around trying to find a safe place, the group of passengers came across the third and fourth engineer, as well as a writer named Mr. Cave. The three men had found shelter in a small side room that was used as a bar, and they invited the passengers to join them though it made the nine-by-six-foot room very cramped. Here, the passengers had their first food and drink since the night before. The third and fourth engineer were not in better condition than the passengers. A third engineer, White, had dislocated his shoulder while trying to save the captain, and they were not able to reset it in the present circumstances. In the bar room, they were able to take stock of the situation properly. Out of the 17 passengers who had remained on the wreck, eight were now gone. Valpy and Cave decided to go rest elsewhere since the room was so crowded, but Mr. Gillette would later say he did not think anyone slept that night as the sea was still pounding the ship. The fourth engineer, Kelt, seems to have taken it upon himself to be in charge of gathering supplies, in spite of the still angry sea. And on his first trip out, he managed to find a bottle of water, which was set aside for the children. He was determined to get to the poop, where there was more water, but in the attempt, was struck by a giant wave. Mr. Gillette only realized what had happened when he saw what he had at first thought was a mattress being washed down the passage outside the bar room, only to realize that there was an arm waving. He ran out and grabbed the fourth engineer, who had been rendered unconscious by a large blow to his head. He was also bleeding heavily at his wrist. For almost an hour, they did artificial respiration and tried to get the water out of his lungs and for another five hours, the passengers took turns working on him and caring for him before they were confident that he was alive. 
For the next five days, Kelt was comatose, only taking a little food and water they were able to force on him and not opening his eyes. On the morning of 11th, with the weather the calmest it had been yet, the passengers determined to find a more comfortable shelter. They eventually found three saloon-class cabins that were in better condition than most of the ship, and one of these was given to the two engineers, Valpy and Cave, while the other was turned into a single large room and housed the rest of the passengers, as well as the two remaining nursemaids for the children. For supplies, the passengers and engineers had a ten-pound tin of Barcelona nuts, five pounds of biscuits, a tin of fruit, and a lot of liquor and soda water from the barroom. These all had to be carefully rationed, since they did not know when they would be rescued. They were not alone on the ship, though. There were two other camps of survivors. The first was made up of nine people and had the ship's stewards, the butcher, and the assistant cook. They were all from Portugal and had found shelter in the forecastle. The other camp was made up of 24 people, and they were the remaining members of the crew from India. This group was berthed under the poop deck, which had remained in relatively good condition, and they, therefore, continued to shelter there. Due to the rough weather, which continued, the three groups of survivors had very little interaction with one another. But all three groups arranged to take turns keeping a close watch for passing ships that might be signaled for a rescue. The first ship they saw was on the 13th. They did what they could to signal her, but she continued on her course, and they assumed that she had not seen them. It turned out they were wrong, and this was the ship that reported the wreck of the Suez Canal. The ship, the Logician, had not seen any signs of life on the Aden, and, considering how the sea was breaking over her, did not think life was possible. On the 17th, they saw a large oil tanker, which passed by them very closely, and even though they were certain there was no way this ship could have possibly not seen them, this ship also continued on her course, leaving the people on board very despondent. On the 22nd, the passengers decided to celebrate Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee with double rations of their soggy and meager supplies, whiskey, and soda water. There was a toast and the singing of the national anthem in what the papers called probably the strangest celebration of the event. On June 26th, 17 days after the Aden had struck the reef, once again a ship approached, this one a large steamer. The passengers once again signaled for help, though this time with less optimism. They were therefore gratified when the steamer, the Mayo, returned their signal and sent them a boat. The passengers were grateful to learn that the Mayo had been sent out specifically to rescue them by the Indian government, and on the 29th, the passengers landed in Port Said. The passengers were transported from here onto England on the P&O steamer, the India, while the crew was sent back to their home ports. The P&O company had known that the Aden was overdue on the 20th, and had sent the Rohila, another one of their ships, to go in search, thinking that the Aden had broken down in the storm. The Rohila had made a search and eventually found the wreck, but this was after the Mayo had taken off the passengers, and the report that there was no sign of life was accurate this time. Once the P&O company learned of the boats that had been lost during an attempted evacuation of the Aden, they sent word to the Rohilla to search the coast for any other survivors, but none were ever found. Or even a sign of a boat ever having come to shore. The inquiry into the wreck could determine little in the way of fault for the wreck of the Aden, since anyone that they would question, or hold responsible, 
was no longer around to answer questions. The newspaper grimly noted that this was the third p and shipwreck in a row to have involved the loss of the captain after the wreck. A bad sign for the other p and captains. Much of the blame was placed on the lack of a lighthouse on Socotra. But this was to continue. No one had much of an interest in funding the project, even while acknowledging how dangerous the island was. The inquiry did praise the crew for prioritizing the passengers as they were being evacuated by the Mayo. The crew had stood aside perfectly orderly through the entire evacuation and allowed the passengers to board the boats that had come to save them first, without comment or complaint. Praise was also given to the Mayo, where all of the people who had been shipwrecked had been treated with kindness and provided with whatever they needed. The seas had not made the rescue easy, and the boats had been in danger with the rough water and the reefs, but the Mayo had pulled it off without incident. The final note of acknowledgement was sent to the India, and was an expression of sympathy from Queen Victoria, as well as an acknowledgement of their jubilee celebration under difficult circumstances. The agent of the P&O company transmitted the message to the passengers who sent back a message, most likely from Mr. Gillette, who had made himself the unofficial spokesman of the passengers. Quote, The survivors of the Aden shipwreck beg to thank Her Majesty, the Queen Empress, for her most gracious message, and solicitude for them, are deeply touched by her sympathy. They are getting every care and attention from the captain and officers of the India. All are doing well. For more information, please see The Master, Mate, and Pilot, Volume 6, Chapter 25, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.